So remember when I said I was gonna go to the supermarket later today? I kinda bailed on that <laughs> because we got the patch, all the cards and everything like at 7 p.m. So yeah, I think uh, we'll order some food for tonight and I'll, I'll take care of that tomorrow in the morning. Just sweeping that under the rug because I, I can't wait, man. I can't just be somewhere else when this is happening and just not talk about it. So I'm going to record a video that is potentially going to be rather long because I'm going to be covering the patch 1.0 notes. And I'm also going to be talking about the or reviewing rather the entire set from the new expansion. So... Sit back, relax, get your popcorn or whatever, you know, snack you prefer for these sorts of things. And I'm going to stop going with the intro and just r jump right into it because it's going to be a while. So let's start off with the patch 1.0. It is the first official patch uh, after we get out of the beta phase. We are on the release of Legends of Runeterra. And it's just really excited, man. Let let's hop into it. Thank you from the lore team. Wow. The past few months have flown by and we'd like to express a deep appreciation for everyone who has played Legends of Runeterra during the open beta. We've learned so much from playing alongside you. With the help of your feedback and playtesting, we've iterated our card balance, progression systems, and even our performance settings to try to provide the best possible experience. We know the game is better for it. Our goal is to continue our exploration of Runeterra. Sweet outplays and awesome champion moments right there beside you for years to come. Thank you for your excitement and passion. We wouldn't be here without you. For everyone who's joining us for the official launch, welcome. You're jumping at the perfect moment with full crossplay between your PC and mobile accounts. Nice. So, uh, Legends of Frontier is available wherever you are. A progression system that's rewarding however you want to play and a ton of awesome cards to collect and play with. We can't wait for you to start with your journey and we're committed to making your experience as exciting and enjoyable as possible. We hope you dive in and let us know what you'd like to see next. Now, onwards to Bilgewater, Jeff, Andrew, Senpais, and the Legend of Runeterra development team. This is just really... It's really exciting to see this this game finally released. If you guys are new onto this channel and you're new playing Legend of Runeterra, you, in, you are in for a treat, whether you are fans of the card game genre or not. I am personally a card game fanatic. I've been playing card games ever since I was like 12 years old. I started with Magic the Gathering. I moved on to Yu-Gi-Oh! Then I went back to Magic the Gathering and I played the likes of Duelist, Gwent, Shadowverse, uh, Duel Masters, the World of Warcraft uh, TCG that later became Hearthstone. I played Hearthstone. I basically played them all, right? I've enjoyed uh, many, many card games throughout my life, and I've had great experiences with them, but Legends of Runeterra is something very special to me because even though I've been uh, delving into this franchise, or sorry, this genre, uh, for my entire lifetime, basically, I have never found a card game that I am as passionate about as Legend of Runeterra. I've been covering Magic the Gathering for a while before I, I transitioned to this game, and I was not, I didn't really feel anywhere near the excitement that I felt for this expansion, right? Whenever a new expansion would be announced for Magic, I would always wait for the last moment and then just do a full review of the cards, but I, I would not really pay much attention to daily spoilers or anything like that. And I told myself, you know, that's just how I approached it, right? But it turns out that it's just I wasn't as passionate and I've really noticed this with this game every time they announced a new card a new series of of champions or followers or spells I would just freak out I would think about all sorts of deck building possibilities and I would just be craving for more and you know I, I guess I'm prefacing this entire video by really letting you guys know, know that my, my excitement is completely genuine and I I just feel so happy that I'm able to cover a game like this and make a living off of, of this. It's just, I feel extremely lucky and I want to thank you guys for all the support as of late and I hope you guys are excited for daily videos and five streams a week as we're going to jump in heavy on this. So without further ado, let's actually talk about the patch itself. Sorry about that ramble there, but I I, I don't know. I, I feel, I guess I got a little bit emotional and uh, I'm, I'm very passionate about this and it's it's really exciting that, that we're finally getting the, the release and everything. Plus the mobile, it, it's going to be sick. So yeah, let's actually talk about shit. Uh, the Rising Tides expansion charts a new territory with the addition of Bilgewater, the next region of Runeterra, as well as 11 new champions and 120 new cards 60 plus cards will be for the new region exclusively while the other 60 will be for the uh, actual regions in the game so that means 10 cards 
10 new cards for each region in the game, including one champion, and over 60 cards for the new region incorporated. As you guys can see here, one new board, which is the pirate board, which looks amazing. Two new guardians. I am a powder monkey fanboy from day one. You heard it here. Uh, I, that will be my <laughs> go-to. I mean, I switch out my guardians a lot, right? But I'm really excited for that one. And uh, 10 new emotes. We're going to be talking about emotes as well. So the new region, Bilgewater, the new cards, we have been mentioning them over and over again. I'm, I'm not really going to read this entire patch. I just wanted to start things like that. But we'll be hovering over and, and talking about the most key things from here, right? For example, the mobile launch. Uh, for those of you who have or may be concerned about the player base regarding Legend of Runeterra, uh, because of the Twitch numbers, etc. I definitely expect a huge surge of players as the game will be available on mobile. This is absolutely massive, especially for a card game. That is where most of the demographic actually hits. And it is going to be really exciting as uh, we're going to be uh, experiencing a huge influx of players and it's going to make things really... I, I really want this game to get the exposure and, and receive the popularity that, that it truly deserves. It, at its core, it's such an amazing card game. It's so well designed and this mobile launch is absolutely massive for it. Uh, it will be launching on iOS and Android. I can't wait to just be able to play this on my phone. I mean, it's not really too relevant. Like, even in quarantine right now, uh, I still like would love love to be able to play Runeterra in the couch instead of having to be in my computer all the time, and I think it's also going to be a perfect game for that. Uh, I've been told, you know, by um, a contact that I have in Riot that the game is amazing in an iPad, and it's uh, you know something that I definitely want to try out myself. So. Um, you guys see all the uh, minimum specifications and all that good stuff. And uh, something that's very relevant here is the cross-platform play, which means you can share your account progress between PC and mobile. This can be considered as a given, but I've played a lot of card games that failed to do this. And it's something that I'm really happy and relieved that is going to be a thing. So this means that if you have an account on your phone, you can use that same account on your computer or whatever other device and you don't have to like do anything else. Like you just basically have a password and you can log in on whatever device you want. And that is absolutely fantastic. We have the uh, Moonstruck Poro launch reward. I believe this is for uh, all the accounts that were a part of the beta. They get like a, a blue Poro guardian, which is uh, pretty neat. First week login rewards. Uh, you know, you can look into these. I'm, I'm not really gonna uh, delve too much into this because there's a lot of shit we got to talk about in this video, specifically the cards themselves. So, region road updates. Bilgewater joins the regions of Runeterra with his own region road, and all region roads are now extended. Very important. We're going to be seeing card backs and all sorts of cool shit, which is really neat. Let's take a look at the Bilgewater board, though. It is beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I love the design. It's so visually pleasing and god damn it, I can't wait to have it. That's basically all I have to say. We have two new guardians, Powder Monkey and Bailey. Uh, Bailey looks cute, kawaii and all that stuff, but I want the monkey. The Powder Monkey is just everything that I wanted for a guardian and I, I, I cannot wait for it. Uh, that will definitely be my go-to, especially when I showcase any sort of deck regarding Bilgewater. The emotes, we're getting 10 new emotes available for 190 coins each. This is what I love about the monetization system in Legend of Runeterra and something that I think is makes this game absolutely amazing is the fact that if you wanna be free to play, you don't have to spend a single coin on this game. You can get all the cards for free, but if you wanna, you know, pimp up your board and your emotes and everything like me, then you can just dump some money and get some really cool shit. 10 new emotes. I saw one that uh, revolves around Yasuo earlier and that, that I, I fucking love it. Uh, these are four of the 10, which I, I really like, but there's uh, other ones that are from, uh, yeah, the Unforgiven Yasuo. No, no, that's the card bag actually. I wish I could show the, uh, uh, where did I saw the Yasuo one? It was in the video, right? <laughs> It's so trolly. I love it. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we got card backs too, which is really sick. We got uh, some uh, tribute to the region, but also some specific to champions. Like you guys can see here, Yasuo, Jinx, and uh, Garen. And I assume that, you know, uh, eventually they will add more and more options, which is really neat. That's something that was definitely missing in the beta, and I was definitely expecting. Per deck loadout, to go along with all the new options, we've added the ability to customize and save individual deck loadouts for boards, guardian, emotes, and card backs. 
Whether you want to make sure your favorite guardian is always along for the ride or accompany your strategy with a the perfect theme, you can now set up every deck just right. I really, really wanted this to be a thing in the beta, and uh, they did it. I also hope they incorporated the... Um, like the ability to to look at the deck like when you have your deck list in in the deck builder or not in the deck builder sorry when you have like your your deck list spread out and you're going to select a deck to play with um in the beta you had like the actual highest cost champion and or follower or or follower sorry uh as like the card that showed the deck right uh, i i hope they made a way so that i can actually just put whatever card i want there as like the face of the deck so I'm I'm pretty sure they, they did that, even though I don't I don't see that specified here, but I, I would be shocked if that weren't the case. Click on the icons to adjust a deck's loadout. Okay, expeditions can also go newly created decks. We'll start with the loadout of your last played deck. Decks created before Okay. Ranked. Launch also brings the end of the beta season and the start of Lore's uh, first post-launch ranked season, the season of plunder. Beta participants will earn a beta season exclusive icon. Okay. And then uh, the ranks parts of reset. Master accounts will drop 800 LP. Eight divisions. Diamond and Platinum will drop. All right, that's that's all, you know, pretty standard. Playing units on full boards. This is a huge change. This is something that we got to talk about for a bit before we actually mention the cards. Um, I'll, I'll be having some timestamps uh, down below, by the way, so you guys can actually uh, access specific parts of the video which you want me to talk about. Uh, this will be all very organized in that sense because I don't, don't want to rush this video. I want to make sure I cover everything and, you know, I, I take enough time for it, right? Playing units on full boards. Uh, having a full board of six units no longer prevents you from playing additional units. You may now do so and select the current unit to be obliterated with your new unit replacing it. This won't trigger last breath effects. And if the new unit you played makes more units after being summoned, those will still overflow and be obliterated. This is a very, this is a massive core change. And what I mean by core is like a, it's a core component of the game. Like uh, it's how the, the the game works, right? If you because there there are certain matchups in which I use this as a weapon, right? I, I would basically punish my opponent for spreading out too many uh, cheap creatures and not and and have him not not have a, a menacing enough board state, and I would avoid his attacks and his damage. And, you know, the, certain decks can do this. And I would punish my opponent for having a full developed board state and not being able to play anything else, right? This is especially useful against elusive decks that uh, use Kinku Wayfinder and, and uh, spread out all these useless chump blockers. If you can find a way to, you know, navigate towards victory without interacting much with their board, you can actually punish them and slow them down significantly. This is no longer a thing. And I think this is, ha is going to have massive implications in gameplay. I'm not sure I'm a fan of this change, to be completely honest, because I think one of the skill sets that are attributed to Legend of Runeterra is being uh, wary of the board limit and uh, trying to not overcommit and get trapped into it, right? That's no longer a thing. Uh, I believe they ultimately did this to prevent frustration for newer players, and uh, I'm not sure if this will be a good thing for the competitive integrity of the game, but we'll see ultimately uh, just how impactful it is. I think it's going to be very, very impactful, and I can't say I'm a fan of this change, but it's not game-breaking for me by any means. It's not something I'm happy to see, though, to be completely honest. Expedition archetypes. We've got a ton of expedition updates for Rising Tides. Again, I'm not really something I'm going to delve into. New player and AI judgment. English. With new challenges and AI decks and all that stuff. Language support. Okay. Miscellaneous. Silverwind Scout renamed to Silverwind Diver. Interesting. Uh, because of the scout mechanic. Yeah, that makes sense. Ezreal level 2 art flipped. For those who saw the Rising Tide previews, we also flipped Maokai. Interesting. Quests adjusted for Rising Tide contest. Expedition trade. Eh. Fixed an issue with Epic Capsules. In-game mail system added. Player support can now fully migrate accounts with incorrectly assigned regions of residence. More info here. And that is basically the patch right there. So, uh, really good stuff here. Let's actually move on to the cards, right? I'll have a timestamp in, in the comments down below to guide you guys through this, but we're gonna start off with the new region, but of course, Bilgewater. We got a total of over 60 cards here to go over. Uh, there's a bunch of skills here. I'm gonna ignore these skills and I'm gonna go back to them when I reach or start talking about the card that actually spawns uh, and is linked to them, right? So we're gonna start off with the actual cards. And the first card we're gonna talk about, the first actual card here, the first two rows are just purely skills and the powder keg, but, uh, 
but you guys can see there's no rarity to them except for the for the powerful explosion i guess because it's linked to a common card I'm not sure anyways the first card is actually warning shot um i have spoken about this card before so i'm, I'm gonna focus especially on the cards that i haven't talked about right as uh the corsair dredgers fizz all of these we've we've spoken about uh, the first one that we, no, this is actually Gangplank's Parley, never mind, so it's actually a signature card, okay, I didn't know that, I thought, I thought a signature card was, was the other one, okay, never mind, alright, so, uh, Jailbreak is the first card that we haven't actually talked about because it wasn't, uh, spoiled, it is a one mana, summon a random one cost follower from any faction. Initially, your first impressions towards this may be that this card is just absolutely terrible because you're paying one mana for a one drop anyways and you're not controlling what you're getting. And that's true, but I think this card will see play in decks. And that's a that's a theme that we're going to see a lot throughout this expansion is ways to promote a high spell density archetype, right? Jailbreak is a way for you to develop a one drop, right? while at the same time casting a spell and this is pretty relevant with the attune cards for example like you can play shell shocker attune get your your spell mana back and then play jailbreak and uh you've played two one drops on turn one like that's actually possible and that makes things really interesting because this card can see play in hyper aggressive decks that try to you know uh make use of the tune for big tempo early opening plays or we can also see this in just a high density spell deck for you to be able to generate bodies on the board uh, through spells, right? It has implications for Lee Sin, it has implications for leveling up Fizz. Uh, like this sort of card has a lot of implications for many of the new uh, champions and followers incorporated into the game and is really, really interesting to see like uh, this card will actually fit many decks, believe it or not. And it's gonna be uh, neat to see exactly how it performs in, in those cases. We uh, talked about all these, Parley, Plunder Poro, Pool Shark, Powder Monkey. We have not. It is a 1 mana 2-1 uh, with Last Breath and Ephemeral. But as you guys can see, it's not actually a card. It has no rarity gem onto it. Because if it was an actual card, it was pretty bad. Even though th there is the uh, the cask from the cask salesman is an actual card, which is not something you tend to play on your decks ever. But I'm happy that this card is, did not take away from like an actual card from the expansion, right? Uh, we assume that this is, there's something that spawned this, and there is, and we'll be talking about that card, which is one of my favorites, actually, uh, from a flavor standpoint. I really like it. We uh, keep going uh, into You've Been Warned. Give an enemy vulnerable this round. If it dies this round, draw a card. I love this card. I absolutely love this card. Uh, I think this card is actually really neat as a one mana spell. I think this card is fantastic. It's like it's like Guile, but so much better. Uh, but it's also highly interactable, right? Like if your opponent has to do whatever they can to prevent the unit from dying, because if it dies, you this card is basically replacing itself in your hand. It's a one mana spell that can serve as a proc for many of the cards incorporated in this expansion that will benefit from you casting multiple spells. And it's a great way to remove a threat because you make you give it vulnerable, you make you can challenge it and remove it from the board. And if you kill it, you replace the card in your hand. I love this design. I think this card is very competitive in the right deck. We'll definitely see a lot of play, and I'm very excited to mess around with it. Big fan of this one. Uh, Black Market Merchant, we talked about this. This guy is even better now that we looked at Pilfered Goods, which is <laughs> one of my favorite cards. We're going to talk about that one soon. Higher Gun, 2 mana, 2 3. When I'm summoned, the Grant, the strongest enemy, vulnerable. 2-3, uh, in case you guys don't know, is the standard, uh, very solid stat line for a 2-drop. So uh, a 2 mana 2-3 two, doesn't have to have a very powerful effect to be worth it as a 2-drop in your deck. And this card is really neat as it gives you a solid body onto a unit that can be used for removal. It makes this 2-drop a good 2-drop to go for in the late game as well. Potentially pretty flexible and I think it's pretty decent, honestly. I, I think this, this girl will see play. We'll see exactly in what decks, but uh, I like I already like her in the Undying deck, for example. <laughs> You know, because uh, I actually like her more than the Lauren Duelist. And that's only one of many decks that you can potentially fit in. You know, it, any sort of deck that can benefit from having your units having Challenger is going to really like the Hired Gun. Make It Rain is actually Misfortune's uh, signature spell, which makes Misfortune much better than I expected her initially. Because I thought her signature spell was, was the six mana play. And I, I think that card is pretty underwhelming. But it turns out it's Make It Rain. So this is a really good card for your signature spell to be uh, as a champion. 
because it's a really good card. It's useful. It's always going to be useful most of the time, and it's just fantastic, and uh, did not know that. So as we move on, we see more Powdered, which summons two Powdered Kegs. We'll be talking about the Powdered Kegs. Uh, in case you want my full analysis on Powdered Kegs, you can watch my Gangplank first impression videos, uh, first impression video, English, in which we talk about fully about the potential of this uh, card. I love this mechanic. I love the Powdered Keg. Uh, I'm thinking about a lot of many different combinations with it and i'm really excited to mess around with it and i like the fact that you have a spell that can spawn two of them for two mana big fan of this card uh and definitely in the right deck it will it will be useful and i really like it but i'm super excited for pilfered goods right here two mana burst spell so not interactable and that's so good draw a card from the enemy deck plunder draw one more so if you if you deal damage to the opposing nexus you're paying two mana. This is like old Glimpse Beyond, dude. You're drawing two cards for two mana at burst speed. Right. You have to meet the plunder requirement, right? Which I sometimes I, I undersell it. Like, it, it's not as easy as I make it out to be sometimes. Like, you have to deal damage to the opposing nexus. And that's not always the easiest thing. But if you do so... It's a two mana draw too. And you're drawing your opponent's cards, which is hilarious. Obviously, that is in a way nerfing this card because uh, you're not drawing from your own deck. Therefore, the cards that you draw are less likely to synergize with what you're doing. But if you mix this thing with the Black Market Merchant, you're drawing two cards and you're reducing their cost by one. So it's like a, a mini two mana progress day in a way, right? Like I, I can't wait to mess around with this. It's one of the cards that I'm most excited about. And I just, I love it. I love it. I, I can't emphasize just how much I like this card. I'm, I'm really, really hyped to play with it. Double Trouble. Summon two random one cost followers from any faction. I think this is uh, ultimately a worse version of the uh, Jailbreak. You know, it is spawning two, but you're paying three mana for it. Um, I, I don't think the value is there, but in certain decks, it could potentially see play. Golden Narwhal is a 3-mana 2-4 with Elusive, which seems pretty damn good, but it does have the downside of being vulnerable, which I don't know if it makes this card really worth your while, but there is another card that spawns this as well, and that, that makes it really uh, neat, because it spawns it for the opponent, right? It's vulnerable, so that means your opponent can always challenge this and uh, remove it, right? Jaw Hunters is a 3-mana 4-1 with Challenger that says, when I'm summoned, create a random sea monster in hand. So it's providing you with good value, upon entry it also synergizes with shadow owls I, I see this card a lot in a bilge water shadow owls combo with stuff like chronicler of ruin amongst other things uh the fact that you can respawn this and it's a summon effect makes it really really neat and uh we we'll be looking at shadow owls soon but they have some sea monsters as well right so it says a random sea monster i assume it'll be from the regions that you're playing in your deck because whenever, whenever they don't specify this that's how it works in runeterra and uh, it's a pretty neat card. Definitely, uh, I think, will be a pretty important card in the likes of Naut Nautilus. Because you will be uh, playing sea monsters in that sort of deck. And I, I like the design. I, I like how frail it is. But I like how they mitigate the frail the frailty with the challenger keyword. Allowing you to trade this into something. It dies to Vile Feast. It dies to, it dies to Mystic Shot. But barring those things, uh, if the opponent doesn't have an immediate way to deal with it, you're launching four attack at something. And the card is basically replacing itself in your hand. So it's giving you card advantage. So I like it quite a bit. It's pretty neat. I, I'm a big fan of Jaw Hunters. I think it's very competitive. Uh, Lore of the Deaths is a three mana burst spell. Reduce the cost of sea monster allies everywhere by one. And then draw a sea monster. Big fan of this card. I think uh, it's hard to not think of this as a staple for a sea monster deck. Because it's replacing itself in your hand. It's doing so at burst speed. It is three mana. It's expensive play. But it's reducing the cost of all the allies by one. Like that's... Like down the road, that's pretty massive. Obviously, it depends on the deck in which you're running it. But it can lead to some really, really good value. I, I, I like this card. In the right build. Monkey Idol is a three mana zero four. And I, I, this is one of my favorite designs. Um, I really like this, especially in a deck with a bunch of health buffs. Because at the round start, you deal two damage to me and summon a Powder Monkey. Remember the Powder Monkey we were talking about earlier that's not an actual card? Because it has no rarity tag onto it. Uh, if I can find them, there it is. So he's a 2-1 with Ephemeral and Last Breath deal one to the enemy Nexus. Which enables Plunder, by the way. Like, this is a very safe Plunder enabler. That's the reasoning behind its design. It dies upon attacking... 
But even if it's jump blocked, it's still enabling plunder. And that's really neat. Monkey Idol has a very solid health stat for a three drop. Uh, it's not gonna attack or block or anything, but it's gonna be continuously spawning uh, monkeys on both rounds, like whether you're attacking or not, which means you can have, you can either just have a free chump blocker in a monkey or uh, an attacker, right? And if you have ways to buff its health and keep it alive, as it's dam dealing itself uh, two every turn, it's just kind of it's a very neat engine. And I don't know how competitive this card is going to be. Honestly, it's very hard to you know assess that. But from a flavor standpoint, and just looking at his design, I'm a big fan of it. I, I'm very excited to build decks with this card, basically. Uh, really, really like it. So as we move onwards, uh, we've seen all these. I, I've already said my opinion on Petty Officer. I think it's a terrible card. I think this is one of the worst cards. Uh, don't like it. Um, pick a card. We've seen Pocket Aces says, when drawn, cost one less this round, which can synergize with some Piltover cards. And Grant and Ally, plus two, plus one. This synergizes with Piltover because when you draw this, especially with like the Investigator, you, it's a two mana card, right? Which triggers her again. And it's a very neat buff. Like if you draw this for two mana plus two plus one, you're granting that forever. That's really good. And I can see this card being used with Fizz. Fizz loves buffs in general. And a cheap buff like this that's permanent, fantastic. So uh, watch out for this card in Fizz decks and maybe other decks as well. It's a very neat buff. Like it, it, it's a lot of stats that you're gaining but for potentially two mana. And even for three, it's not that bad at all either. It's actually pretty decent. All right, sleight of the hand, plunder, draw a random non-champion from the enemy hand. This card is just pure meme. This card is pure meme. Uh, you're drawing one card from their hand. It's random. It can't be a champion. You're paying three mana for it. You can get a one drop. You can get a big card. It's just, uh, it's too much variance for this to be competitive, in my opinion. But it can be pretty fun, <laughs> or funny, rather, in the right deck. Uh, for three mana, we got the slot bot. Talk about variance. <laughs> we're, we're witnessing more of it. Round start, grant me plus one health for each card you drew last round, then shuffle my stats. So every turn, it's getting one health for each card you drew, and then you're shuffling its stats, which means it, if it's like 0, 5, it could be a 4-1, uh, uh, a 3-2, a 2-3, a 1-4. Like, <laughs> it's, gonna be, it's gonna be all over the place. And all of a sudden, like, this guy can have like eight stats piled up, but then it's a 7-1, and it dies to a vile fee. So I don't know how competitive this thing is gonna be, but again, pretty fucking hilarious, and uh, I will most definitely be trying it out. Because because maybe the stat gain is just pretty absurd in the right deck, right? Like, I could see this thing in a Twisted Fate deck getting really big, and that could be pretty good. So, uh, Brass Gambler, I expect a lot of things from him. We talked about this uh, earlier in the Twisted Fate reveal. Chum the Waters, uh, Ch uh, Fizz's um signature card which i think is a bit weak but fizz is gonna be pretty nutty so it balances out Island navigator is a four mana two four with scout we see a scout keyword on bilgewater outside of demacia so it is available here as well when i'm summoned create a random one cost unit from any fashion and grant it scout um i like this i like the house that um i like the fact that it, it is a four mana two four but it is spawning a one drop i like the random component of it there's some really neat things you can get and if you get any sort of like elusive like, it's a random one-cost unit from any any faction. So, you could actually... They're saying faction, though. Why are they not saying region? This is not Gwent. Why are they saying faction? Why, why, is, why is the term faction here? Interesting. Uh, regardless, um, you could get Fizz out of this. <laughs> you could get you could get a Fizz with Scout <laughs> out of this. <laughs> How ridiculous is that? This could be super high rolling, dude. Um, I like this card. Um, it's I think it's gonna piss people off every now and then if it gets a lot of play, and it's uh it's pretty interesting. You know, cards that that the, that spread out over two bodies tend to be better than cards that just have all the stats piled up in one. And the the stat line is not that bad at all considering Quinn is a five mana three four. Like it's not really un that understated considering you're getting an, an extra body out of it, and both of them have scout. It's a pretty valuable card. I think it's pretty damn decent, honestly. Uh, Mystify Magician is also really fun looking. Transform an ally into a random five cost follower from any faction. So the ideal scenario is to take a one drop or a zero drop even and convert it into a five drop follower, right? 
There are some very neat ones. I have a lot of, a lot of experience uh, doing this because I play a lot of the Undying with the Ethel Remitter. And when you sacrifice the Undying, you spawn a random uh, five cost follower. So I'm pretty familiar with the uh, the pool. I know I know the worst pool right now is the Troop of Elnux. And, but you can get stuff like Hearthstone, uh, Hearthstone. <laughs> um, what's the, um, Avaros and Hearthguard. Hearthguard, Hearthstone. <laughs> got confused there so you can get the avarice and hearth guard you can get the uh kato uh you can get a lot of very very good ones like a lot of really neat ones and that's a lot of value they can be getting but you're, you're playing four mana for a two two right so it balances itself out it's never gonna be too crazy and transforming i don't, I don't know if there's any any cards right now in the pool that benefit from you transforming shit but it can be really neat, like to transform like a monkey, for example, like combining the the magician with uh, with a monkey idol and transforming the the monkey into a, a five drop follower. That's pretty funny. So there, there's going to be some cool combos with this guy. Uh, I'm excited to try him out. Uh, as we go onwards, we see the allegiance card for Bilgewater is the Yordle Grifter, which is a four mana through three. When I'm summoned, create a warning shot in hand, which is the zero mana deal one to the nexus to enable plunder. And uh, Allegiance, draw one from the enemy deck. Now, honestly, out of the Allegiance guys, this, this, this guy seems a little bit weak compared to stuff like Bannerman. Um, but he's still pretty decent. And, you know, maybe uh, an Allegiance Bilgewater deck is in the makes. In the makings. <laughs> God, my language is bad sometimes. But uh, I like it. It's not, it's not too great, but I think it'll be all right. Uh, Zap Sprayfin is a 4 mana 2-2 two, two with Elusive and Attune. When I'm summoned, draw a spell that costs 3 or less from your deck. Now this may seem like, oh, a random effect, but this actually could be a very precise tutor in the right deck. Like, this card could be really, really neat in the right build that's like really fishing for a specific 3 mana, 2 mana, or 1 mana spell. And you can build your deck so that this random effect is really irrelevant, right? Because you're going to be, you know very well what you're going to be getting. Um, I like this card. I think it has uh, some neat potential in that regard. And it, the Attune effect is a nice, you know, uh, uh, addition onto it. It has Elusive, so it's not, it's a good body and a good potential chump blocker against Elusive decks. And uh, it's pretty neat. I, I, I am a big fan of this card. I like it a lot. And it could also see play in Elusive decks potentially because it can fish you for just buffs in general, like, you know, standalones or, I mean, if you're playing Elusive, you're mixing this with, with Ionia, right? So standalone is not really something that you're going to be getting, but, uh, you know, you could be getting Twin Disciplines, stuff like that. Uh, but I, I'm more excited about this card in a deck that can actually, that really, like, wants to be able to tutor a specific spell consistently. It can really put in the work there. Abyssal Eye is a 5-mana 3-3 with Deep, which means it is a 5-mana 6-6 six, six, if you have 15 cards or less in your deck, with Elusive and with a Nexus Strike effect that says draw a card. I am a little bit scared about this because if this guy gets abused in elusive decks, it's going to be pretty fucking disgusting. But it is a five mana card, right? Uh, the value is definitely there. Very excited to see that this is a sea monster because I love the idea of playing this in a Nautilus deck to, uh, you know, uh, draw cards and and uh, be able to, especially because because the drawing effect also allows you to thin your deck to enable a deep as well, right? I really like that a lot. This card could be pretty powerful. It is a 5-mana card, though, and uh, normally it's going to be a 5-mana 3-3 with Elusive, which is very easy to kill. But I, I think I think this thing has potential. Definitely uh, has a lot of potential. It's hard to, like, really, you know, measure it now, but uh, definitely we'll be trying it out for sure. Hunting Fleet. This is what I was talking about with the Gordon, uh, the Gordon, the Golden Narwhal earlier. This 3-mana uh, 2-4 uh, with uh, Elusive and Vulnerable. You're already spotting this thing. In order to play a 5-mana 7-7. Seven, seven. I don't know if that's worth it. Because it's not like a 5-mana 7-7 seven, seven is overly crazy. You know, we're getting a lot of, like, really good 5-drops. A lot of them being champions. And having a little bit, you know, more stats can be nice. But I'm not sure if that's ultimately... Like, I see this card seen play in decks that can capitalize or benefit from you spawning creatures onto the opponent's board. But now, now that there's... Uh, what we were mentioning earlier, now that there's no uh, limit... To your to your board state, which um, it says right here, uh, yeah, playing units on full boards. Now you can't even use this thing to like fill up your opponent's board and prevent them from summoning stuff, right? So it kind of loses potentials. I wonder if this was one of the cards that was responsible for that change ultimately, but it could have been really strong in that case. But now it just doesn't really do much. I think um, I don't think it's a good card. 
Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I I don't think the stat line is a good payoff for giving your opponent a three a three sorry a three drop that's a two four with elusive. Even if you can challenge it, it's still a free unit that you're generating for them, right? I just don't think the stats are there. To be completely honest with you, uh, we got the Razor Skill Hunter, which is a five mana four four with Scout grant an enemy vulnerable. Um, I actually like this design. Uh, the stat line is pretty humble. But it is a scout, so it can attack twice, and it can uh, attack a unit, remove it, and then attack again. It's pretty neat. Uh, I, I really have to test just how efficient Vulnerable is as a removal tool. But it seems to be really, really effective. And I, I will be trying this guy out. He doesn't seem incredible, but he seems pretty decent. Slippery uh, Wave Rider, 5 mana, 4-4 four, four with Elusive and Attune. Not much to say about this card. Uh, it's just another 5-drop elusive with a tune. I'd rather play Abyssal Eye for a 5-drop elusive, honestly. Not really too excited about this one. Um, as we go onwards, we see Devourer of the Deaths. This card is really cool. 5, sorry, 6 mana, 4-4 four, four with Deep. Play, generating a skill, which is what this little circle means. Obliterate an, an enemy with less health than me. Um, this is the skill right here. In case you're wondering, Devour. Obliterate an enemy with less health than me. This is super cool. I love the design. It's really interactive. Uh, your opponent can utilize uh, either damage base removal or just damage in general to weaken this thing and potentially avoid the removal itself. While well, you can counteract this with health buffs as well. It's a way to make health buffs offensive. And I really like that. I really like that. You can mix this with Froyord and have stuff like Elixir of Iron or uh, the, um, the Bloodstorm Pledge amongst other things to allow this to uh, basically remain a high health stat and remove something because it is a skill. You can, you know, add shit on the stack to it. And if, if your opponent responds, and I just, I really like this card. I think it's it's a really neat design. I love it. I like the fact that it's deep, that it's a sea monster, and I'm very excited to try this thing out. Uh, Sheriff Lariat Rose, hope you like my French pretty top tier in my opinion to be honest just saying when i'm summoned grant all enemies vulnerable six mana six five seems really good to me uh seems really solid it's it's a very it's pretty crazy play man it's like on guard but on a stick and that stick is a six five right like i love the idea of playing this in in my undying deck and just be able to just challenge everything uh i i like this card in many different decks uh, I think this card excels in mid-range matchups, and uh, I think it's got a pretty decent stat line to back it up. Uh, I love it. I love the concept. I love the flavor, and I think it could be a, a very, potentially a very powerful effect. It depends on how efficient Vulnerable is, but I, I think it's it's great. Because keep in mind that Vulnerable is a keyword that, um, you know, you're granting them, right? So when you give something vulnerable, if you don't kill it that turn, it's still going to remain vulnerable. So you can try again on your next attack, which is important to know. Uh, Strong Arm is a pretty hilarious card. Plunder, place a follower in play into your hand. So you're going to be, this is basically a more expensive, slow Will of Ionia that is returning, it's placing, right? It's, it's putting the follower in your hand so you're recalling it but to you <laughs> but it's only a follower not a champion so uh this card is pretty funny it's limited in regards to what it can do it's expensive uh it requires plunder to activate and it is highly disruptible as well so um i don't think this is going to be very competitive but it's going to be a pretty fun uh, card to play around with and depending on matchups it, it could be really strong right but yeah, it's, it's more of a fun card, in my opinion. Uh, Scrapshot is a 7-mana spell at fast speed that tosses 3 and deals 7 to a unit. So, like, you know, it's kind of like a, a worse version of a Vengeance, but it is tossing. So, it could be pretty decent in a Nautilus deck as a late-game source of removal that helps you in your strategy. So, I, I definitely think I'll, I'll be trying this card out in that archetype and see if it actually, you know, warrants a slot or not. Uh, and then we got the, uh, the Mind Meld... <laughs> Uh, these cards, these these like th last three cards are pretty insane. Mind Mel, this round set all allies' power and health to the number of spells you played this game. <laughs> so, in the right deck, this is basically eight mana. This resolves. I win. 
As simple as that. Uh, I'll be trying this card out. It seems pretty memey, you know, because it's very, it's a very expensive, uh, slow spell. But and we've seen cards like uh, the new version of um, Pack Mentality not really see much play at all. I think this card falls in that category more or less. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's a little bit better, but I don't expect it to be a high tier card. But I, I will be messing around with it. Riptide Rex, though. <laughs> oh, Thunder. Cannon Barrage seven times on random enemies. What is Cannon Barrage, you say? Well, let's have a look at it right here. Cannon Barrage is a skill that deals two to a unit. If it's dead or gone, because your opponent can react to it with like a glimpse beyond, deal one to the enemy nexus instead. So it's kind of like a pseudo overwhelm in a way, right? And uh, with the Riptide Rex, you're doing this seven times. 14 damage across the opponent's board. That's fucking hilarious. That's that's hilarious. Like, I wonder if like this is going like seven times on the stack. So I believe there's only like a maximum of 10 potential uh, skills or spells on the stack. So it's taking up like 70% of that space on this effect alone, which means your opponent can't just like interact a bunch with it at the same time, right? Uh, unless I'm wrong. But yeah, like you're, you're, you're activating this seven times. So you're clogging up that. <laughs> that, oh, that stack right there. And uh, this is a massive, like, this is kind of like a board wipe. This guy is just basically a 7-4 stick on a board wipe. And I fucking love it. <laughs> I will I will try it out for sure. The Dread Weight is a 9-mana uh, fearsome unit. I am recording, right? Okay. This video is going to be quite long. Play, uh, draw a Gangplank, double all damage dealt by allies. So another ship to fish for Game Plank. We saw the version for Misfortune, but there's another one for Game Plank as well. And double all damage dealt by allies. So a finisher, an absolute finisher. Uh, nine mana, rightfully so. I like the fact that it's um, you can play this, you can attack, and uh, you can just you know obliterate your opponent. Uh, Synergizes with a bunch of, of uh, direct damaging effects within the region, and is a pretty fearsome, you know, pun intended, finisher at that. Uh, and that is basically the region that is that those are the cards for the Bilgewater region. My overall, my general consensus of this region, I, I love it. I think it's absolutely, it's incredibly flavorful. It's super exciting. It's, it's very diverse in regards to keywords and mechanics and, and synergies. And, uh, from a deck building perspective, I just cannot be any more excited. That's, that's where I'm going to end this. Uh, I don't want to make this video any longer than it needs to be. So 10 out of 10 for this region i am in love and i will definitely be playing bilge water uh on release like i was thinking i was gonna go with noxus first but i'm, I'm gonna be going bilge water because i just there's too much shit i want to do and so little time so uh let's move on to the fraudyard region now uh these are going to be significantly shorter than the bilge water one because we're talking about over 60 cards now for each region we'll be talking about 10 cards uh, which were added, and we're going to jump right into that. Uh, we, we see that they're labeled as new. Caught in the cold, two mana, uh, slow spell, give an enemy unit, frostbite, and vulnerable this round. Um, this is, it's kind of like shatter uh, in a way. Um, you're giving a unit vulnerable, but it's not like the one mana spell that can draw you a card if you kill it. So I'm not really a big fan. I mean, the frostbite effect onto it is neat, but I don't think this card is very good, to be honest. Um, for the same reason Shatter isn't. We have uh, Shared Spoil. I won't be go going over the ones that were revealed now, by the way. I'm going to be over going over the the ones that we haven't seen yet. That, that way we'll go more, you know, we won't make this video super long. Uh, so Shared Spoils, grant the top three units in your deck, plus one, plus one. Plunder, draw one of them. I think it's a pretty neat card. Um, you need to enable the plunder effect to be able to actually benefit from this because you do want to draw the card. Otherwise, uh, it is, in a way, uh, a weaker Omen Hawk. So you definitely want to be able to enable the plunder uh, to make this card worthwhile. But if you do, it's pretty damn good value. And I love the idea of combining this with Starlet Seer. You know, like shit like that. It's The, the more cards we get, the more good uh, or cheap spells we get, the better tr uh, Starlit Seer will be. And I love the idea of mixing Fraudyard with Bilgewater with all those cheap spells and getting some massive value out of this guy. You know, who goes there? I can't wait. Amber Maiden, you know, we talked about her before, but I just want to, you know, mention her for one second and praise what is potentially one of the strongest cards within the set. Praise be Ember Maiden, our senpai, our lord, our savior. Praise be. All right, let's move down and uh, let's talk about, we, we know Fear of the North, Wolf Rider. We, most of the Froyo cards have already been revealed. 
but not this one. And I fucking love the name. Aurora Porealis. <laughs> just, just fucking take my money, right? Just, just shut up and take my money. Create two random Poros from any region and two Poro snacks. So a Poro support card, a pretty uh, powerful one at that. Though the the thing is, you're creating two random Poros, uh, you know. But you're creating this. I I have to clarify this. Like, are these spawning onto the board? They're creating it onto your hand, right? Because it's a pretty expensive spell. It's a pretty high value spell, though. It's like a it's like a progress day for Poro, right? Like you're getting two Poro snacks and two Poros. Like that's just really that's so much value. You're drawing four cards with this. Like this card is hilarious, and I will definitely try it in a Poro deck. You can I can guarantee you that this card is pretty fucking nuts. Like. <laughs> It's actually, especially with the Poro Snacks buff. Yeah, that's actually, I'm going to try that. I'm really excited for that. So that's it for Frillier. Um, let's move on to, wait, Bill Sight, Obliterate. Oh, yeah, that's the, uh, that's that. Yeah, never mind. Okay, let's move on to Noxus. Uh, Frillier was the one with the most, like, with the most revealed cards. So there wasn't much to say there. Um, we got the Black Powder Grenade, deal one to an ally unit and deal, to deal two to the enemy Nexus. I believe this is a skill that will come with some unit or something. Um, we see Ravenous Flock is indeed uh, Swain's signature card, which is really massive because I think this card is fucking fantastic in the right deck. Um, as we go down and uh, let's see, new cards, new cards. Death's Hand, deal two to an enemy unit and one to their Nexus for three mana. Uh... It seems all right. Like, I don't really care too much about pinging their Nexus, but at the same time, it is pretty relevant if you want to enable Plunder. So it's pretty neat because of that, right? Otherwise, it would be pretty, like the one damage would be in, uh, irrelevant. But the fact that it enables Plunder uh, may make this card better than it initially seems. Iron Ballista is a 3 mana 4 3 with Overwhelm. Yeah, solid 3 drop, you know, typical Noxus style. Just smork, face, and go face some more. Uh, what else? What else we got here? City Breaker, we already know. We go down. There's our Daddy Swain. The Armored Tusk Raider. Six mana, six five with Overwhelm. I only take damage from enemies' units with five or more power. Basically, I don't give a shit about little pussies. I only take damage from men and big, strong women. <laughs> Just muscles. You need muscles to take this guy down uh, through sheer damage. And I like him. He's not really... I still don't think he's that amazing. Um, he's just he's he's a bit of a glorified uh, alpha wall claw in my opinion, and that's basically what what there all there is to him. I'm not particularly excited about this guy. He's, I guess for for Timmy's who like big dudes and overwhelm, he's, he's he's cool. He's okay, but I'm much more excited about the Arc Glint Horn. Six mana, six six attack, stun all damaged enemies. And I know, I know what a lot of you are thinking. Yasuo, Yasuo, and yes. Yes, I actually like him with Yasuo. I actually, I'm conflicted though, because I it sucks that they made him a six drop. I really did not want them to make him a six drop because you already have Minotaur Reckoner as a six drop play. I would love for him to be a five drop instead, you know? If he was a five drop, oh my God. But he's a six drop and uh, he conflicts, it's a bit conflicting with him, but then again, you can just lower down your upper curve and just have multiple six drop units, but... I don't like what it does to a potential Yasuo curve, but outside of that, um, this card could see play in just regular Swain for all your decks as well. Who knows? I'm really excited. Really like this effect. I think it's really neat. And uh, that's basically it for Noxus. I'm very happy to see our Glithorn. And uh, overall, Noxus got some really neat toys this expansion, and I'm extremely excited to try out Senpai Swain. So let's move on to Shadow Isles. Shadow Isles got some very neat things. As they have sea monsters, uh, alongside Bilgewater, they are the other uh, region that has access to sea monsters. And they have some neat ones uh, as well. Bark Beast is a 1 mana 1 1 that says the first time an ally dies, grant me plus 2 plus 2. So it has the upside of being a 1 mana 3 3 if you uh, kill an ally, which is a very easy thing to do if you're playing Shadow Owl. So... Uh, has big implications as a one drop for potential aggressive Shadow Owls focused deckless, especially those who uh, resort to the Curse Keeper, Ravenous Butcher Core, amongst other things, and uh, can be pretty damn good in that regard. Because if you're if you're able to reliably trigger this thing, a one mana three three is no joke. But at the same time, it's not a one mana three three because when it comes, it's coming on the board on turn one, it's it's gonna be a one one, right? So that's that really sets it back. It's not nearly as good, even if you manage to trigger it by turn two, it's not nearly as good as you would think. Um, as we go down, 
we see the sapling toss, summon a sapling next round, which is the sapling here, doesn't have a rarity, so it's not an actual card. So uh, you're able to spawn that for uh, with a spell at burst speed, which could have some neat implications for any sort of spell-based combo deck. As we keep going down, uh, we see the Blighted Caretaker. I really like this card. Uh, another kill effect, which I love. I love the Self-Sacrifice uh, um, archetype within Shadow Isles. I love cards like Chronic Little Ruin, Ravenous Butcher, um, Aristocrat sort of themed synergy. And this card contributes to that by killing an ally to summon two saplings. You're getting a very weak stat line, but you are spawning two saplings. Uh, which are these challengers for, for one mana, which is actually a pretty big power play. And uh, Blighted Caretaker. So turn two Curse Keeper into turn three Blighted Caretaker is a pretty fucking fantastic play. Like, it's actually massive tempo. And I am a big fan of this card. Definitely, I think this is a very good card. Uh, in the right deck, really good card. Um, we got the Sap Magic. Not really too excited about that one. Maokai, like... I wasn't too hyped about Maokai in the beginning, but I'm actually really hyped about him now, having seen all the toss mechanics and all that stuff come, coming to light. We have uh, our our five mana. Basically, it is uh, Phantom Prankster's daddy, right? Neverglade Collector. When another ally dies, drain one from the enemy nexus. A five mana, two, four. Stat line is rather weak, but not overly weak. Like, it has four health, which makes it pretty resilient. And... This is really nutty, dude. Like, if you combine this with, with this card with, like, Ancient Secrets or uh, any sort of, like, spawn effect, <laughs> the drain, this, this card could be, like, the ultimate aggro killer in the right deck. It's pretty crazy. Uh, I actually really like this as an aggro burn counter. It's pretty insane. And I'm very excited to mess around with it. Really excited for this card. This card can be really powerful. Really, really powerful in the right deck. Potentially even a very solid tournament card as well if you're if you want to counter aggro strategies as uh we we go deeper deeper and we see the deep the terror of the tides uh sea monster from uh what are the other sea monsters by the way there are are there, are there more sea monsters or is that the only one i recall seeing another one but i i think that that must be my imagination yeah it's my imagination so there's actually only one sea monster with his shadow owls i thought there were more okay so it's just one it's terror of the tides but it actually uh, gives it synergizes with she monsters, right? Which is why it, it stuck with me so much because it, it's direct synergy with the with the tribe, and uh, it's an indicator at uh, at them potentially wanting you to mix uh, the likes of um, Nautilus with Maokai in a deck. Uh, Terror of the Tides has deep and says attack, give enemies minus two attack this round, which is really neat because sea monster allies have fierce and talk about a finisher. It's like your shit can't block me. This this is a really powerful effect, dude. This is a legit finisher in like a sea monster deck. Oh my god, dude. Minus two attack. Like what? Like you're denying all blockers. It's the same as just like give all my shit elusive basically. And even the ones that can block will be significantly weaker. Wow. Wow. This is this. Wow. This guy. This guy is legit. This card is pretty scary. And I'm excited to try it out. All right. Let's go on to Piltover and Zunt. As uh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to keep this under one hour, but I will try. As uh, we move on to, we move downwards. I believe the first card is a two drop. Yeah, Trail of Evidence. Uh, create a random two cost card in hand. It costs zero this round, which is really neat, honestly, because this happens to synergize really well. Like the more I'm seeing, the more I'm, I'm really thinking insightful. People, people have told me, multiple players have said, ah, this card sucks. I don't think so. I think this card has tremendous potential. The Insightful Investigator, uh, with all these new toys coming, like you can definitely build a deck with a very high density of two drops, and this card can be pretty insane. Like, quote me on that. I, I, I expect big things out of this four drop, and I'm very, very excited to uh, theorycraft with it. But yeah, Trail of Evidence creates a random two cost card in your hand, then it costs zero this round. Um, it's, just, it's there basically to give you like another spell play and uh, a good two drop play to go for, even though it's completely random. Um, you know, won't see play unless it, it's very specific decks that want you to be playing a two mana spell. Uh, having that said, we move downwards. We see the gotcha, the investigator, uh, the suit up. When drawn, cost two less this round. Set an ally to four four. So if you draw it, it costs two, and it, it on the right unit, it can be like a significant increase of stats, but it's also very limited. 
uh, in that regard. Um, not sure how I feel about this card. I feel like there's a lot of things. It has a lot of requirements for it to be just a two mana plus three plus three. You want to play this on, on a very you know weak unit, and you also want to play this when you draw it, right? I, I don't think this card is, is reliable, honestly. Um, as we go downwards, we see the, uh, the sub Percival. <laughs> I just, I saw this card earlier, but I didn't realize, uh, the pun. It, it's, it's a reference to Pursuit of Perfection. I just realized, oh, that's so fucking perfect. Uh, five mana, one five. When I'm summoned, draw one. Then if you played at least 10 other cards with different names, grant me plus four attack. So if in, in the Pursuit of Perfection deck, it's a five mana, five, five with elusive that draws you one card. So absolutely busted, right? Uh, really excited. I, I want to build the Pursuit of Perfection. Now that we have more, more cards, uh, we can definitely justify that archetype even more so. So really, really excited about that, honestly. Um, I think Pursuit of Perfection got much better with the set, low key. Uh, but this is the card that I'm most excited for out of the entire Piltover and Zon package. Chief Mechanist Zevi. Holy shit. Six mana, five, six. When you draw a card, give it fleeting and create a copy of it. Sorry for the balancing, but I can't help myself. This card, my god, dude. This card can be insane value. This card in like a very tempo-based, low-cost burst speed spell shell, and that was like very long, is nuts, dude. It's absolutely nuts, man. Like you can... This card just, it, it has a decent stat line. Like, 5-6 is not bad at all. Like, it's its not a bad stat line at all. Like it's, it's a pretty thick body. It's hard to take her down. And, my God, the value is just so promising, dude. Like, this is low-key the best card, I think, for Piltover and Zon. This card can be nuts and, and <laughs> potentially toxic as well. Oh, my God. I, I can't wait to try this card. That's all I'm going to say. I'm really, really excited for this one. Uh, I think it has massive implications. And it, you know, exacerbates my love for Piltover and Zon, which is, in fact, my favorite region in Legends of Runeterra. So, having that said, let's move on to Ionia. As with Ionia, we got some very, very neat toys. Uh, I, I've, I rambled a lot about Return and Resonating Strike. But we got to see the Eye of the Dragon, which is a two-drop with one three stats. With a tune that says, round start, summon a Dragonling if you cast two spells last round. Uh, this is pretty damn neat. Um, if it doesn't get removed, it is generating you with constant bodies. And the fact that they have lifesteal is really relevant because this card can be really strong against aggressive decks. Really, really strong. Every round you're spawning one of these can be a good blocker, can be an attacker, and you're getting a little bit of life every time. And it's just a very neat two-drop engine. I I'm a big fan of it. I really like it. From a design perspective, I, just, I really like the card. Um, as we go down, we see... With Sonic Wave and Retreat, uh, we keep going down and down and down and down. And we see Deep Meditation. Cost two less if you cast two plus spells last round. Draw two other spells. Uh, broken. Bro absolutely broken. Fundamentally broken. Very easy requirement to meet in the right deck. And uh, a two mana, draw two cards at burst speed. We're seeing a bunch of regions getting uh, reliable card draw outside of, you know, Glimpse Beyond from Shadow Owls and others. And uh, while I'm very excited for this, the fact that it had to be Ionia, the fact that Ionia had to be the one that got a, perhaps the best card draw spell, uh, kind of worries me because fucking Karma is gonna love this shit, dude. And yeah, this card is this card is crazy. Deep Meditation is absolutely crazy in the right build and it's gonna be amazing for any sort of Lee Sin deck amongst many other archetypes. This card is outstanding. Uh, it's 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 very specific. Like you have to, you definitely have to um, uh, play. You have to play two two or more spells, right? Which is not easier than. But you can definitely enable this. You can easily enable this. Uh, if not, it's just for four mana draw two, which is not bad at all. Uh, really, really strong card. Um, we got horns of the dragon, uh, six mana four six with double attack, which is uh, you know all right. You know nothing too crazy. You know it's a six mana card. Uh, it's pretty. Eh, but it's it's there, I guess. <laughs> it exists. Not particularly exciting. And uh, that's basically it for Ionia. Uh, I've already said about Dragon's Rage. I think the card is pretty terrible. And it's definitely a, a downside to Lee Sin. But Lee Sin is pretty powerful. So I guess it balances things out in a way. 
And that's basically it for Ionia as we move into uh, Fatal Strike. If you have an attacking ephemeral ally, kill Ren Shadow Blades blocker. Why, why is that a skill? What, what am I missing with that? If you have an attacking ephemeral ally, kill Ren Shadow Blades blocker. Fatal Strike, Ren Shadow Blade. Um, did they redesign this? I'm, I'm a little confused with that. Okay, if anybody can clarify that in the in the comment section down below, let, let me know. Regardless, we're gonna move on to um, to Demacia as the last uh, region, and we see Rangers Resolve, which is a one mana. Uh, it's like a chain vest, but for all of your units for just one round. I'm, it's hard to assess if this is better than chain vest or not, because in most decks in which you want chain vest, you really benefit from the grant effect, right? But this card could be really neat in a, in a more aggressive deck that's not really... Because Chain Vest is more for like combo decks in which, you, in which you're trying to buff one unit specifically, like standalone decks, right? Ranger's Resolve fits a very different archetype, and I think it can be a really like a really powerful combat trick for just one mana. It's like, it's it makes blocking into Demacia really scary. This card could be extremely powerful. Uh, it's hard to say, but it, it could be... It's doing a lot. It's doing a lot for one mana. Especially, like, the more, the bigger your board is, the crazier this card is. Um, as we go down, we got the Valor, uh, the three mana, four, four. Nothing to see here, folks. We keep scrolling down. Grizzled Ranger, crazy, crazy four drop. Concerted Strike. This card is insane. Choose an enemy, two allies, strike it. It's not like single combat in which they strike each other. No, no, it's like Whirling Death, but you don't have, you don't have to be in the combat to uh, do this. And... You choose two allies and they gang up on them, right? Keep in mind, it's a five mana play, but this is like a five mana vengeance in a way. It's a better version than the Tain, in my opinion, and it's really, really, really solid removal uh, for five mana. One of the best in the game, in my opinion. This card is outstanding. Absolutely outstanding. Uh, what else? What else we got here? We got Gen Genevieve Elmhart which is a challenger scout. When I'm summoned, give other allies plus one, plus one this round. A uh, really powerful effect if you're able to sw uh, swarm with the board. And the fact that it has scout with challenger, that's a very, very strong keyword combination, which makes this a really solid six mana play despite the fact that it's so low statted. Uh, pretty impactful. I think it's a pretty damn good card. And last but not least, we got unyielding spirit. Grant an ally, I cannot take damage or die. So basically, will Ionia or, or bust? As simple as that. Or Purify. <laughs> it gets countered by Purify. It gets countered by Will of Ionia. Uh, it gets countered by Minna. But it can get, it can be stunned. It can be Frostbitten. But you can't really deal with the unit otherwise. Uh, really interesting. Uh, I'm not sure if it'll, it'll, you know, go beyond mean factor. Because it is an 8 mana play. Very expensive play. But I could see this in some crazy control deck. You know? That just has this like really strong unit that you just don't want to ever die. Like unyielding spirit onto Lux. That's pretty fucking sick. That's really good, right? That's pretty damn good. Yeah, this this card made me much better than I, I initially thought. Yeah, th this is interesting. Very interesting card. And uh, just over one hour, uh, I'm gonna be ending this video here. Uh, I did make it as short as I could, but I had to go over all the cards. I am so excited for this expansion, guys. I'm going to spend all night theory crafting uh, decks for tomorrow as I will be, uh, you know, obviously streaming tomorrow. And the game, uh, for those of you who don't know, the, the patch will be unleashed at 7 p.m. Central European Summertime, which is 10 a.m. Pacific Time. And I will be streaming all night. I, I, I will be marathoning uh, quite a bit uh, as... You know, it's, it's it's worthy. It's a worthy time to do so. And I'm just so damn hyped, man. I cannot wait. Thank you guys for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know what you think about the cards, what uh, combinations you're most excited for, and all that good stuff. And as usual, have a swell day. Love ya. Hope you're as excited as I am for the new expansion for Legend of Terra. And yeah, I'll see you guys around.